Perfect. So I'm Jennifer. I'm one of the nurses at my MAT clinic, my MAC clinic. Um, I am also in recovery and I am a certified um, alcohol and drug counselor that works with the team with Dr. Dehimi, Jeanette, and um, a few of our nurse practitioners. Um, so today we have one of our patients that was going to talk about her experience with um, abstinence as well as medication assisted treatment and how that's been in her life um, on both sides, as well as I want to introduce Dr. Dehimi and have him just introduce himself and then we can get to Shelly and um, her story and then open it up for any questions if you guys want to put it in the chat box or raise your hand and, and we can get to you along the way. Dr. Dehimi. Yeah, okay. Um, and I, hi, my name is David Dehimi. I'm um, the medical director of my MAT clinic and I'm a board certified physician in both uh, anesthesiology and addiction medicine. Um, I've been doing addiction medicine now for about eight years. And uh, basically we have, um, we work with drug and alcohol treatment programs, uh, providing uh, medical services for patients from detox all the way down to sort of medication management in the outpatient setting. And then we have our clinic um, where we treat um, patients with medication assisted uh, treatments primarily, which are sort of maintenance medications that we, we talk about every week on this um, Zoom. And um, so those are kind of the two main hats I wear and uh, those worlds kind of overlap. So um, we're just trying to get people like, to get a better understanding of what the choices are uh, in terms of medications that help um, make the chances of recovery better. And um, after, I think after Shelly talks, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the differences between um, sublingual or oral buprenorphine and the injectable buprenorphine, because that was something that I was told that people are interested in knowing about. I can introduce myself a little bit further that um, being in recovery for four years, I went through a program that was through the diversion program and uh, the, the nursing board put me in. And that was an abstinence-based program that works really well because there was a lot of um, consequences and, I, and a chance that I could lose being a nurse. And, and for me, that was something that um, I didn't want to lose. So, so the abstinence-based programs are, I think, great if, if there's a, a really big consequence that, that can happen if you don't follow that program. And, and they taught me a lot of... Um, how to be responsible, I, random drug testing every day, I had to check in um, and just be responsible for my recovery. And, and if I had a dilute urine, what I was gonna do to remedy that. So looking for solution in, in how I was gonna change things myself. Um, so I do have four years. I started working in recovery, I wanna say maybe two, a year and a half, two years ago. It's probably been longer than that. and was introduced to Dr. Dehimi and Jeanette through a detox I worked with. And um, Jeanette knew about my situation and it was really freeing to me to be able to be a nurse and work in a, in a program where I could be honest about what um, I was struggling with and not have to, um, not have to put on a face and, and that air of um, everything's fine, I'm a nurse. You know, it happens, it happens to the best of us and it doesn't discriminate. And even though I had the, the cognitive portion of my brain where I knew what I was doing was harmful, there, that part of your brain that, that um, is overtaking where you can't stop is, is a really strong drive. Um, so, you know, getting people to understand between abstinence and um, having the support of medication, you know, without, I think without really grave consequence, um, you know, it's really hard for people to stay sober. So uh, the medication, I believe, uh, adds that little support to them and is, is really helpful. And I see it in our, in our population, our patient population. So I'm going to open it up to Shelly and Jeanette to speak more on um, Shelly's experience with complete abstinence as well as being on, on maintenance. So this is Shelly. I'm sorry, I'm going to 
get the camera tight on her. Um, she's been with us for six months now, and she has a, a, a very good story. She has a lot of years of abstinence-based sobriety, actually counselor working in treatment centers, couple hiccups, couple long hiccups, and has been with us since October. Um, I'm just gonna let her take it over. She, she's had some different thought processes about MAT years ago too. Yeah, I have had lots of different ideas. I was just telling Jeanette, um, well, I'm, my name's Shelly or um, Michelle Wilson, and um, I'm 39, I'm gonna be 40. Um, and I've been struggling with drugs and alcohol since I was 12 is when I went to my first uh, rehab for methamphetamine. Um, I, the, the very first time I really tried to get sober, I was 20. Um, I did pretty good for a year. I had a few, um, I had a few hiccups during that time. Um, and I ended up um, using again, and I was very involved in AA. Um, I relapsed uh, with a boy I was trying to fix. And um, I, my ego just kept me out, you know, it was just too much for me to go back in there. I just could not sober up again, you know, it's like once I woke the beast, it was over. And so I was off and running because I didn't really understand what was going on, but I, I knew that I couldn't stop getting loaded, you know, again. And so I just figured that AA didn't work for me. Um, I went to prison after that. Um, and I did five years in there and I got sober and it was, I was abstinent while I was in prison. And um, I had finally found freedom, you know, I was really excited and I, and I did a lot of work on, on stuff while I was in there. I was in a treatment program. I was a peer counselor in the um, prison I was at. And, um, you know, I thought that I'd done enough work on myself when I got out that I could probably drink, you know. And so I started to drink with my family, which ultimately led to other things. Um, I ended up getting in trouble. Uh, with the law, which um, instead of sending me to back to prison, they actually sent me to treatment. I got sober at Pat Moore um, on June 3rd of 2012. And I was, uh, God removed the obsession. I worked the steps. I had an amazing recovery. Um, probably uh, one of the happiest people I ever knew. I had a little bit of mania, maybe. I don't know. Um, <laughs> But I did what I needed to do, and I and I loved my life, and I didn't think that people that took um, Suboxone or, um, you know, I just didn't think that people could be sober doing that. I thought that they uh, were seeking meds. I thought that they can't have a spiritual experience. They're blocked. Um, I had all these preconceived notions, you know, before I ever had any experience with it myself. Um, I a couple of things, a lot of things happened. Uh, very traumatic. Uh, events, a lot of loss, um, a lot of, of grief that I, I just, I couldn't get through. I was diagnosed with PTSD. Um, my ex died, his leg was amputated. There was a lot of things. And um, I didn't know what to do. I uh, would just cry all the time. I ended up um, relapsing. I wouldn't tell anybody that I needed help. I was too prideful because I was the helper. You know, I was, um, like Jeanette had said, I was working at Northbound Treatment Center and I just was too ashamed to tell people that I was hurting, that I was dying in the middle of AA. Um, and I, I ended up relapsing and I relapsed for two years and it was really bad. It was, it was really gnarly and I couldn't stop. No matter how hard I tried, no matter what the consequence was, it didn't, it didn't matter. Um, I, I was arrested twice and um, and then I overdosed in like rapid succession within like seven weeks of, of each other. And um, I, uh, did you reach out to Rory? I reached out yeah. to Rory. Yeah. yeah, I reached out to Rory and asked for help. Um, a little while after Northbound had actually brought me in and I ended up going in treatment with where I worked for a long time, but I couldn't stay sober. I, I didn't want to use, but I couldn't get sober and I was totally destroyed. Um, so, like I said, I continued to relapse for quite some time and I reached out to Rory and he had talked to me before about getting on Sublocade and I, and I liked what he had to say, but I was terrified of getting on Sublocade because I had people that had been on Suboxone before and what they said about coming off of, of Suboxone and the pain in their bones and their body, um, I just, I didn't want to do it. And I also thought that people wouldn't think I was sober if I did, but at that point, I just was so, um, I would have done anything to get sober because I just couldn't do it any other way. 
and it's been like a, it's been a dream come true. I I got the shot. Um, I had one uh, relapse. I drank right when I got it, so it was like three days out of detox. Um, and after that, you know, I um I haven't had. I mean, I haven't had any cravings. Um, I I don't feel high, which is like the major part of it that I love. When I was on the three hundred milligrams, it was a little bit. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I was a little sleepy in the afternoon at about three. Um, but besides that, I didn't feel any other effects from it. And I was so grateful because I, I work the 12 steps. I'm very involved in AA and I believe in AA. Um, and I just, yeah, I needed that extra help. And I'm, I'm on a hundred milligrams now. I've been on for six months and I don't even notice I'm on it. There's not, I don't feel high. I don't feel like um, it's blocking any kind of spiritual connection it's amazing and i actually got a friend of mine at work to get on it because he was on so much um suboxone he was on 24 milligrams so yeah i mean i'm i get it i've been on all sides you know not thinking it's a good for people of like oh well maybe for them but not for me to like i'm i'm just all in it's just been uh, such a blessing in my life and my recovery i'm just really grateful so when shelly came to us she she was still really scared and resistant and nervous about the whole thing. I mean, it was pretty, pretty tough for her at the beginning, but boy, you really embraced it very quickly. And, um, what was it? When did you have your emergency surgery? Oh yeah. I had an emergency <laughs> surgery. My appendix ruptured and I was telling them it was because I was late getting my sublocate that I was, um, yeah, she withdrawals. Thought she was in withdrawal. <laughs> So it she was, sent her to the February. hospital and, you know, literally you were out of the hospital in a couple of days. And I was out of the hospital in a week and I took no pain meds and I was fine. Yeah, I was fine. Yeah. So yeah, there's been lots of stuff, but I got through it and they were like with me every second of the way. Thank God. Cause I didn't go to the hospital Yeah, because I just thought I was sick. But they told me to go. So yeah, it's been a great experience. Thank you, Shelly. Um, we can open it up to questions now if anybody has any questions for Shelly or for if Dr. Dahimi, um, you can raise your hand or, or put it in the chat box. And Hi guys, I wanted to come on and just kind of, um, I was kind of called to share on Shelly's story. Um, I'm Alexis. I also work at Miami T Clinic doing some admin work. Um, I'm also sober almost nine years. And um, I also went through like AA, the 12 steps absent, abstinence based. And, um, but regarding Shelly, um, she's a very good friend of my partner's. And, you know, for a while there, I literally would tell my partner, like, I think that Shelly's going to die. And um, I, like, I'm getting kind of teary-eyed because, you know, we were still in contact with her, and um, I think we went to a football game, and, you know, I'd ask her, like, is Shelly sober? Is Shelly sober? And he's like, I don't know. I don't know. And I just, like, had a bad feeling, and, you know, like, she was struggling with, you know, going to treatment, and it, nothing was working, and... Um, mm -hmm. I think when, you know, she started treatment and then relapsed and you just don't know what's going to happen, you know, like you literally just think that they're going to die. And, um, and so when she went to treatment this last time and it was suggested she go on it, like I was, I wasn't sure how it was going to work for her and, and it just worked out, um, you know, it's been so awesome seeing her sober. And one of the things that, like, I talked to Dr. Dahimi about, maybe he can elaborate on it, is I was, like, four or five years sober. Sorry, my little girl singing. Um, when I was, like, four or five years sober, um, I went on antidepressants because I was still sober from, from alcohol, but um, my, which was my DOC, but I was still acting out, like, in other ways, you know, trying to, like, get that like fix trying to get those neurotransmitters like whatever it was with shopping or food or whatever and um and so I went on antidepressants and it like changed my life and so what Dr. Jahini pointed that out about you know like well and I, I'm not a doctor so it's hard for me to explain but like you know antidepressants like 
well, shouldn't a higher power help you with the way that you feel in terms no. of like your neurotransmitters helping you with no. that? No. But, you know, I did, um, I went to school and majored in clinical psychology. I'm a nutritionist. So like, I understand like how the brain works a little bit in terms of neurotransmitters and, um, and also trauma. Like I have a, a lot of trauma. So I understood that like my brain chemistry changed and it needed help, you know? And then when I watched the video that like my MAT clinic shows clients, it kind of gives you an explanation of, you know, the, parts of the brain that shut off and take over with addiction and um but maybe Dr. Dahimi can elaborate a little bit on it and um kind of give light to you know how those two are kind of related you know antidepressants and then MAT so that's all I have thank you <laughs> hey uh, I have a question I'll, I'll comment on that in a moment but um Shelly when um couple of questions. Were you ever on sublingual buprenorphine? Yes, I was on it. Just getting the shot? Yes. Yeah. And um, what, what, was your, what was your highest dose? Um, I think I was on uh, 12, uh, I was on 12 milligrams a day. Okay. And did you notice like there are parts of the day that you had cravings and parts of the day that you're doing well? Yeah, absolutely. That's why I was afraid of the um, sublocate because I, I would sometimes take it to get high. Like I knew I was going to feel good when I take it. Yeah. Okay. And then um, my other question is, um, you still use AA and NA as sort of a, a basis for, for behavioral, the behavioral side of recovery. And um, how do you, how do you navigate the, you know, um, various groups when, I mean, do you just not tell them? Uh, does the subject not come up? Do you, is it an AA friendly uh, MAT AA or how do you, how do you deal with that? That's a good question. Um, actually, I, I am very open, you know, about what goes on in my life, especially in meetings. It's very important for me to be transparent. I talk to my sponsor about it and my sobriety sisters, but I really feel like it's up to the individual, you know, it, it, yeah. A lot of it's like taboo because like when people are on Suboxone, a lot of people have the same ideas I do you know, that I had about getting high and all this. But um, I share with people about what it's like to be on Sublocate and I encourage other people that are struggling with relapse to, to get on it because you don't feel high. Like that's the thing. It's so different. It's not feeding that same part of the brain. So yeah, I'm open about it. I, I don't care if people like try to tell me that I'm not sober. I know that I am. Right. Okay, so that's very good, and, and that sort of segues into um, what Alexis was just saying. So um, looking at just numbers uh, with regards to people who are in recovery or are actively using, uh, about 50% plus uh, people that have a drug and alcohol problem have also have at least one diagnosable underlying mental health disorder. And the common ones are depression, anxiety, Bipolar has an extremely high prevalence of substance use disorder, um, schizophrenia, and um, PTSD. So just off the top of my head. So you talk to any number of people that um, are in treatment, and 50% plus will have one or more of those diagnoses. And oftentimes, those diagnoses predated the drug use, and um, the drug use was a way to self-medicate. Uh, because those conditions weren't properly medicated. Um, and so when I think in terms of like, you know, how we treat people um, in recovery is we treat the total person, right? So you can't just put somebody on MAT meds and not address any underlying psychiatric uh, illnesses. You can't put them on just MAT meds and not deal with social problems, like do they have housing, transportation, can they even get a job? Um, so you have to kind of go after bio, psycho, and social. And the mental health piece of that is a huge part of why people uh, get stuck on drugs and alcohol in the first place. And so if you go into treatment and you're detoxed and um, you know, you're doing very well, and let's say they even address the mental health piece, that's great, but that still doesn't address the cravings piece. And so especially early in recovery or as your story related, over and over in recovery, 
cravings are a, a big problem for people and they're often the thing that leads to relapse. And like when you came out of jail, you just drank a little bit, but that's all it takes because that leads to the next thing, leads to the next thing, all due to cravings. And so the main thing that MAT drugs, and in this case, we're talking about buprenorphine do, is they, they, they um, diminish cravings rather, rather substantially in most patients. And sublocade, and we'll talk about this later, the kind of the differences between buprenorphine sublingual and sublocade. But the reason that sublocade works so good for so many people is um, once you get the injection, you have a stable level in your blood that lasts for more than one month. And all the decision-making around taking, taking your daily dose of sublingual buprenorphine, uh, whether you're gonna, you're gonna take more than you're supposed to, whether you're gonna give some to your boyfriend, whether then you might sell a little bit because it would be good to have a little bit of drugs that you buy with that money. All of, and all of the decision-making is no longer a decision for you because you're essentially on the one dose once a month. And um, so that behavior pattern gets extinguished. And for people early in their recovery in particular, um, you're having to make a lot of hard decisions all day long. And um, when one of them has to be around whether or not to take your controlled substance properly, that's when people get into making bad decisions sometimes. And that's where um, some of the bad reputation for sublingual buprenorphine comes about. Um, we, hey, have Dr. Hmm? we have two hands raised. Tina oh. put in the chat, she asked, is sub Sublocade use for alcohol and drug addiction, and when should the patient start seeing um, the results? And then um, we also have Deborah that um, has her hand up, so we can. You guys, uh, okay. go ahead for the first one. Uh, I'll uh, let me finish real quick what I was saying, and then I'll tie it up with Alexis. So this was a long way of me getting back to uh, psychiatric medications. And to me, they're just another form of MAT. Um, because if you've, if you've dealt with the cravings, but not the underlying depression or anxiety or what have you, then you haven't treated the whole person. And if you've dealt with that psychiatric, psychological component, but not the cravings, then you haven't um, treated the whole person. So they need to go hand in hand for patients that, that need both of those um, addressed. And, um, Anyway, so I don't really, in my mind, these are all medications that promote recovery. And for individuals to say that one type of medication is okay for recovery, but another type isn't, um, that's really between the patient and their doctor, not the uh, patient and their AA uh, friends. So um, that's kind of my take on mental health medications, which are very important. Um, with regards to the question, uh, sublocate is not used for alcohol. Sublocate is specifically for opiate use disorder. Um, uh, moderate to severe opiate use disorder is its indication, um, just as sublingual buprenorphine is. But two things, there's another medication called uh, uh, naltrexone that comes also in a once a month injection, which has been shown to um, help uh, well, actually, its first FDA approval was for alcohol use disorder or alcoholism, and it's been shown to be very effective in treating alcohol use disorder when combined with behavioral uh, treatments. And then sublocade um, or buprenorphine when used properly, let's say the drug of choice is opiates, which in which case you'd use this medication. Um, when the patient's behavior is stabilized and their drug of choice is stabilized, oftentimes we see uh, the other drugs of abuse also diminish as a result. Um, does that, does that answer the question? And then she also, there was a second part is she was asking when should you start seeing a change in the addict? And I, I know that we've discussed in previous Zoom, she's new to our meetings, um, that, uh, you know, the medication is along with, uh, uh, other types of therapy, you know, whether it's one-on-one -on -one group therapy or, or other things. So it's not just the medication that's going to, going to help, well, you know, it does help, but it, but you need also behavioral changes in order. Yeah. It, in has order to be, to 
we, we kind of will beat this one to death every week. And, you know, these medications, they'll help immediately uh, with physical withdrawal, uh, with cravings, with um, extreme behaviors. But, but the long-term gains that people are, are you know, wanting to, to have or to see in people they care about um, comes after doing the behavioral side. The medication is not a magic bullet. Uh, you need to do the work um, on the behavioral side to get, at, get an understanding of why it is that you were using drugs and alcohol in the first place. What are the kinds of wounds that you're trying to treat? What type of trauma from your past isn't treated? What kinds of relationship problems are you getting into that, that bring up you know, the desire to use drugs over and over, like bad choices? All of these things are part of, of making the decision to use um, drugs and alcohol. And um, without addressing that, you know, you just end up going in circles. Right. And then there's another question, Tina, um, for Shelly. How long for the taper from the 300 to the 100? Um, we, I think we had her on the 300 milligrams for a few yeah, few months. the way it's sort of the manufacturer suggests that you do two months of 300 and then you drop down to the 100 after that. Um, we have patients that when we try to drop them down to the 100, their cravings come back. So we go back up to the 300. And um, Jeanette can probably say, I don't know if we ever drop somebody, or, or you probably know as well, do we ever drop somebody after one dose of 300 down to 100? Um, I have not seen that. We we actually try to keep them on the 300 um, for a, a little while longer, especially if they're chronic relapsers. So I know that the the approval was for the 300 for the first two months and then dropping it to the 100 milligrams. But if people have a long history of relapse and are still having cravings, even after the two, we'll keep them on that 300 and then. Yeah, absolutely. Once they, they say that they're ready to drop to the 100, then we do that. Another question was, um, Jody, you can unmute yourself and ask that. <laughs> she says, why do doctors prescribe two different types of benzodiazepines at the same time when they are for the same thing, such as depression or anxiety? So two, two different benzodiazepines at the same time. Um, I don't know why that someone would do that other than some benzodiazepines are long acting low potency and some are short acting high potency. Um, personally, I think that's kind of a recipe for um, problems. And I don't think that's a very common practice at all. It is. It's a common practice. There's so many, <laughs> I know of uh, uh, quite a few young adults who are prescribed clonopin and another antidepressant at the same time. I don't know why. What other antidepressant? Pardon? What other antidepressant? Anti-anxiety and antidepressants sorry, at the same time. Benzos, or are you meaning a, a benzo and an antidepressant? Both, yeah. A benzo, antidepressant, and anti-anxiety meds. But, you know, if you look them up, of them say it's used for the same thing, like for Jared, Cymbalta, and Clonopin. Okay, I misunderstood. I'm sorry. I thought that you were talking about two, two types of benzos sorry, at the same time. I, I misread the, the question. Yeah, no. So why do they do that? Well, that, that is common practice, Jody. Um, so, you know, most of our antidepressants that are commonly prescribed work through the serotonergic system, like S. SSRIs they're called, like, you know, Prozac, Paxil, Zoloft. And some of them have um, dual antidepressive and anti-anxiety effect. But for yes. some patients, but for some patients exactly. that's sort of a slow acting, long-term treatment where you can't make changes day to day and see any change. So sometimes they'll prescribe them benzos on top of that for like more acute anxiety. That so chronic anxiety, you're treating with the Zoloft and then and depression, and then you have acute anxiety because something, something traumatic happens in your life, you're having a hard time coping, then maybe they put them on a, on a benzo as well. Right. So do you see that doctors are over-prescribing those pills? 
Benzos are, the as we talked about a few weeks ago, they're one of the most overprescribed medicines in the country. Um, they, America uses <laughs> a grand majority of the world's supply of benzodiazepines. And these are medicines that initially were thought to have not a lot of consequence associated with them, but they have tremendous consequence associated with them when you use them over a long period of time. Um, trying to get off them can be extremely difficult and prolonged. You can have rebound anxiety, rebound insomnia, agitation. You can have sweating. I mean, it's, it can be a nightmare for people. Yeah. I do not advocate, uh, I'm not, I don't prescribe much benzos unless it's in a short term context, like I'm trying to accomplish something very short term. And then I get people off of those meds. As far as the other drugs, the antidepressants, um, some people are on those for life. And those can be a very, very helpful class of medication that doesn't have much dependency or withdrawal associated with them when compared to benzos. I'm gonna unmute Desiree. She had a question on how long you can be on a, a maintenance dose. Yes. Hi, Desiree. Hi. Um, I wonder how, um, for, for how long can somebody be on a maintenance dose? The answer is, is it for years, for example. For example, for years? Yeah, or? yeah indefinitely. Um, there are people that have been on methadone for 20, 30 years, and they're high functioning. Um, same, with, same with buprenorphine. The answer is indefinitely. And what, I, what we tell our patients uh, is that, you know, we'll cross that bridge when you're doing so well in the other areas of your life that you've built a solid foundation upon which you're building your life on, and that you are stable in all these other ways, uh, stable relationships, stable financially, stable from a housing standpoint, you don't have any legal problems, um, and that you know, you're, doing, you're doing things to demonstrate that you're increasingly healthy. You, know, you're, you're, you have a routine, you're exercising, you sleep well. Then, we have, then it's like, okay, well look at your, your life now is looking much more along the lines of somebody who's high functioning. And that's when we can start talking about weaning off if they want to. And um, yeah, I mean, that's an individual decision at that point. So we just talk about the pros and cons. Thank you. You're welcome. Bonnie, I'm gonna unmute her, I had a question for you um, regarding, uh, the requirements for a doctor to order the subotape. Hi, thank you. Um, my son is a recovering heroin addict and he is on butamorphine and every 30 days he goes into Transitions Clinic in Sacramento. They write I know that clinic. <laughs> Pardon me? I know that clinic well, Dr. Flynn. Yeah. I visited, uh, I visited there last year. That's funny. That's, you mentioned it last week, so I thought, oh, good, I can ask this question because that's where he goes. And they write the prescription for his butamorphine, and then he takes the prescription to Kaiser where he gets it filled. Mm -hmm. If he were to change to the injection, would, they ha would he have the injection done at the clinic? Ooh, that's a super good question. So I, I had this little thing I did uh, about pros and cons of sublingual buprenorphine versus the injection. And uh, one, of the, one of the drawbacks of the injection is number one, there are hardly any providers that are doing it relative to people that will give you sublingual. And the reason for that is it's a big hassle. It's a complicated process to get insurance approval. The medicine costs like $1,600 a month for insurance companies to pay for. And um, part of what our clinic does is, is, is have people on the phones arguing with insurance companies, um, and they're really good at it. So more and more insurance companies are coming along now, but it's not as simple as me just writing on a piece of paper, or handing it to you, and you take it down the street. Um, so I don't know exactly whether Kaiser even provides that medication. If they do, it, huh? Excuse me. They do provide, they provide it. Is, are we in the pill form, right? Yeah, yeah, you're talking about the sublocate injection, right? Uh, not the injection. He takes, I believe, in a pill form. He takes pills, the uh, butamorphin daily. Right, but were you asking about the injection? Yes, I was. Yeah, you're saying, so he has Kaiser insurance, right? Correct. 
So you're wondering if he ha if he could get the approval through Kaiser, where would they do the shot? Um, no, actually, he he goes to transitions every month yeah. to get the prescription. But where would he go to get the injection? What well, the sublingual? To... Sublingual is the injection, right? No, sublingual is the pill or the fill. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you for sure. sure. My mistake. Yeah. So there's the oral form, which is it melts in your mouth. Yes, that's what it film, And then there's the injection that you do in your abdomen that's once a month. Okay. And, okay. and when we're talking about um, the last, um, Shelly and our patient from last week, they both had much better success with the injection. Um, and they come once a month for their injection. And so they go to your clinic to have the injection? That's right. That's, that's what I wanted to know. Where would he get the injection, I guess? Yeah, so if Kaiser is his insurance, um, first of all, they'd have to authorize it, and then they would have to give it to him. They would, okay. Yeah. Do, do they administer the injection at transitions? Do you know the doctor there, Dr. Flynn? Um, last time I was there, they didn't have it because I was telling them about it, and they all seemed very interested. Okay, thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. You're welcome. Jennifer, you're muted. Is there anybody else that has questions? I know Marion uh, Long, let me unmute her because I know her son is one of our patients and she's had some questions um, when she comes in. So Miriam, I'm gonna unmute you. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, my, I think my son's been going there for about six months and he's still on the 300 milligrams. And I, in his behavior, I think his behavior is actually getting worse than better. He has no job. He doesn't respond to calls. He doesn't show up on time. It's, uh, nothing has changed with him. And I just don't understand, um, he, you know, he's probably not doing any therapy or probably any outside help. But I thought I would start to see some changes after a couple months. And I, I'm just not sure what's going on. Okay. Um, hey, Jeanette. Hey, Jennifer, do you want to ask Jeanette um, what we're seeing? Um, to, the short answer is, as I've said a couple times, um, there is no free lunch here. You have to, you have to do, you have to be willing to go to behavioral, uh, have some element of behavioral treatment in your recovery, um, whether that's going to meetings, whether that's doing an outpatient program, whether that's having a private therapist. Um, these things are all very, very important. And behavior change doesn't magically come about just because you have the shot. You might not spend as much time on the street trying to get your next dose of heroin about to go into withdrawal, but, um, but, it might not, but it's not going to take care of all the problems that you have in your life that led to you using in the first place. And I'll say one other thing his chances of overdosing on an opiate while he's on 300 milligrams of sublocade are extremely low. So even if nothing else were changing, his chances of dying have diminished uh, rather greatly. Um, but I don't know why he is, is or isn't engaging in behavioral treatment and why, from your point of view, his behavior is not better. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's really up to him, I guess, to get help. It is, and I, you know, can't even really talk about it specifically without his approval. So, um, and can I share a little bit about that? What she what she asked just sure. from my standpoint. So, I mean, it's kind of comparative to like. I mean, either I can take myself, for example, or any number of clients. Like, I can have there can be fifty clients in a treatment center, and you know, ten of them are doing amazing and getting better, and you know, learning all kinds of things. And then, you know, there's a few other ones that are in groups saying we're not learning anything and, you know, we're not getting better, can't get anything out of these groups and other people are because it's not, it's not just like a, a one thing that's going to fix it. You know, it's like diet and exercise, like to be healthy. Like you can't just do one and not, not the other. Like there's, it's more complex than that. You know, like for me, like the, the shot is really helpful as in it helps me with the cravings like I don't want to use and I know that even if I did I wouldn't get high so it's just like an added um tool piece yeah it's a tool for recovery it's not that's not just my recovery there's so many other things that I that I do to change 
Yeah. So there needs to be a motivation there, you know, some internal motivation. So let's say, Shelly, you're, you're um, 80 pounds overweight and you eat, you eat uh, you know, processed sugar foods all day long okay. and you go to the doctor and they say, oh, you know, you have diabetes now. So we're going to start you on um, some oral diabetes medicine. And if you don't stop this and change your lifestyle, you could end up on insulin and it could hurt your heart and your, and you know, a lot of other parts of your body could be affected by it. Well, the behavioral change there is you need to start eating better. You need to exercise. You need to um, do the things that resulted in you getting diabetes in the first place. And these, I, but a lot of patients, they won't. They'll just come in for their diabetes medicine and wonder why their diabetes isn't getting better from month to month. And this chronic disease is even more complicated because it's a disease of the brain that involves motivation and behavior. But you're exactly right. If you don't do, if you're not wanting to do the things to change the underlying reasons for why you, you self-medicate, then you won't see much improvement. And then I have a, a Deborah who has her hand up and has a question. Okay, so for the the two recoveries that are in here, uh, one Alexa and I don't know the other gal, is it Shelly? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so I have a couple questions for you. Um, <clears throat> when you are going through this and, and before this, uh, as far as your support from your friends and family members, how did they play a part in um, your success and or not um, or hinder and um, or actually more important what worked for for you and their support in in your journey um, I would love to hear that and also um, yeah let's start there that's okay so how did go ahead um, and are so they and are they getting treatment too are they going to their program being this is a family disease are they are they attending their own program so that they can help you through that? Just kind of, if you could share if that's the case, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. That's a good question. Um, my family, a lot of them, unfortunately, uh, they're alcoholics and they're active uh, in their disease. So although um, they don't go to Al-Anon or anything like that, they do support me getting better. Um, they did have some, just like me, they had preconceived ideas about me getting on Sublocade. You know, they weren't really sure about it. But after they've seen um, the benefits and the effect of my recovery, that I'm not just sitting on the couch nodding out all day and, you know, I'm working. I, I do a lot of things. You know, I engage with them. My life significantly changed. They're super supportive. And um, I think that the, it plays a huge role who I surround myself with. You know, I surround myself with people that also um, are on, like either in recovery or, you know, they're normies, but they live a solid good life. So it's really important. My grandma is a huge support for me. And she, my grandpa went through Betty Ford. And so she did Alan on back then. So she is familiar. And so did my mom. So I, I have a mix of both. Mm -hmm. And, and I know that. I know it plays a big part. I personally have been in Naranon for 12 and a half years. Yeah. And it's really helped to support my addicts in their recovery, whatever way they choose along the way, but also save my life. So, yeah. um, but I, I appreciate that. Alexis, how about for you? Um, so mine's a little different um, than Shelly's. Well, no, I guess not really both. Mom. Both my parents are addicts, Mama. and um, when I got sober, Mama. I was like a binge drinker, weekend drinker, Mama. so I didn't drink daily, but um, I Mama. hit like an emotional yeah. bottom where I wanted to Mama. commit suicide, Mama. and um, and so I like, I had been seeing a therapist for a long time, and she suggested that I go to al Mama. Mama. Bella, Bella, I'm talking, okay? She suggested that I go to Al-Anon, and, um, and that's kind of where my story began, and then that's when I realized, like, oh, I have a drinking problem, but at the time, like, my mom was, you know, on meth and running havoc, and so I was very, like, codependent on her, and so it triggered my drinking, and then, um, and when I got sober, yeah, um, my family didn't understand um, about alcoholism or anything like that. And I got a lot of my support from my therapist and from meetings. That was like my only support. And then 
Um, and that's kind of the, still the same thing today. Like I still have to go to meetings. Like I still have to connect with my community, um, with my sponsor. Um, both my parents have passed. My dad died in September and then my mom passed like four years ago. And, um, so I kind of got an idea of like what would happen if I didn't get sober, you know, like I got to see the consequences like very front and center. So it was a big motivator for me to get sober. Um, but yeah, I hope that answers your question. Well, no, I, yeah, I mean, it's just how important it really is. Cause I started my, no, program yeah. I started my program before my addicts, you know, yeah. found what worked for them. Um, and it was the best thing I ever did because I was dying right along with them. Right. So much. It so, is a family disease. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and that's pretty awesome. much, yeah, pretty much I needed to take care of me. And that was so important. Um, it's funny cause somebody sent me today, um, a, a little article or a little picture about you know the battery of your phone and how you would never let your battery on your phone die, but you would um, but you would definitely not do self care and allow yourself to die. So it's really I, it's really a, a a great thing to know that there are programs out there and other things for our, our loved ones because my you know my life was absolutely hell you know before I started Naranon and. And recognizing the things that I was doing and contributing to my addicts in my life. And once I started changing that, that's when change started happening all around me. It's not perfect, but it is definitely progress. And I always, that's why I continue to go to my meetings as a loved one, because I'm addicted to my addicts. I'm just as much an addict as they are. So I knew that that's what I needed to do. And I'm so glad you guys are here to share that because I think it's real important for all those parents and loved ones of addicts to understand that we all play a part in this. We contribute and um, granted, yeah, you might have an addiction with the substance, but I had an addiction to my addicts because I was basically killing them with kindness. And um, it was the best thing for me is to realize and recognize those things that I was doing. And I'm so, thankful for you guys sharing your story because it, it just tells me where I need to stay and where I need to continue to keep working and, and working on me. And that way I can lead by example and they can continue to follow and do their own journey and I can support them in it. So thank you though. That's it. And then I see Tina has a question here. Sorry, let me get her unmuted. Hi, Tina. Can you? One more time. Sorry. I, keep I, I think <laughs> I, I had asked what um, ISUDT is, but somebody had answered it that it's the integrated substance use disorder treatment. I was curious because my son is in prison and due to get out in July, but he's been transferred. He's in Riverside right now waiting on another case um, to see what's going to happen. So that Somebody answered it in the chat. Oh, okay. Does anybody else have questions? I oh. think someone asked about yeah. their son being in prison, getting out in four months. Do you want to have insurance? What would we suggest? Right. I um, text back, but I know I see Jody is. Go ahead, Jody. Oh, okay. Yeah, I just wanted to say what Deborah mentioned about uh, being addicted to her son his and his ways and his addiction mm -hmm. there's so many parents that are and she's not alone in that respect so many parents become addicted to their kids what they're doing like 24 7 they, they actually have on their cell phones they can see everything what they're doing when they're using where they're at and it's like I have friends moms who it was like destroying their life, it was, you know, because they were so addicted to what their kids were doing. And I don't blame them for being that way. You know, you're so scared and you don't know where your kid is and you want to know where their kid is like 24 seven. Um, but I know those, those parents who ended up getting some help themselves and they stopped that. They stopped monitoring where their kids are 24 seven. Um, and for their own health reasons, they stopped and they feel better about it. And I don't know, Deborah, I, I just think, um, you know, it's, it's amazing that you're doing that. You're still there for your son and, and that's what's important. 
and when he wants help, you're there for him and you're going to help him through that. But um, you can't, you can't, you know, hurt your own health by monitoring 24 seven what, what they're doing. So good for you, Deborah. So it's Diana that is on the iPhone that had the question about her son that's in prison. Okay, thank you. Let me. So it's Diana. Yes. Let me look for her. I it, I think it's just an iPhone. Thank you. So it maybe is. Jeanette can share about how yeah. we've had a son in prison. Yes. Yes. So we were we we've, we've done that a few times, and if you have someone that's incarcerated, we've had parents reach out to us, and as long as they have some sort of insurance at that point or Medi-Cal, we can actually kind of cue them up and get the medications for, or get the medication when they come out. Luckily here in Orange County, what's happening is they're now actually putting people on buprenorphine if they have a history. And, uh, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, I had a young man come out. I had to have him come here after hours because I'm obviously treating him like he's COVID positive because of the outbreaks that they're having in jail. And he came in, did a history on him, gave him an injection, and he's actually doing quite well. So, um, you know, you just need to find the provider that's willing to do that. Um, coming out of prison is one of these things that he will be able to get Medi-Cal. And Medi-Cal is one of the quickest payers for subupay. That answer your questions? Um, I have Diana unmuted if you wanted to respond to that. I have something to say. Go ahead. If, if, so if Medi-Cal is willing to pay for a $1,600 a month injection, uh, that should tell you a whole lot about um, the direction things are going in terms of MAT. They don't pay for anything. That, that is that expensive without evidence and without um, doing a lot of cost benefit analysis in terms of like, is it worth it for us to pay this? Um, so what they've come to the conclusion of, and they haven't told me this, but this is obvious, is that um, these patients cost the medical system and the legal system way more money than $1,600 a month. So that's why they're willing to they're faster, they're faster doing approvals for Sublicate than any of our private insurance companies are. And um, so I'm hopeful that this is, this is gonna be an impetus for other insurance companies to follow and to make that approval process easier for us. Um, okay, and then I, I don't know if Diana, if you wanna try again, she's. I don't see her being muted, but I don't know why she's not able to um, to come through. Is there anybody else that has questions or um, wants to talk about MAT related? Oh, I have a one more time for Deborah. Okay. Deborah, yeah, I'm sorry. I have another question too. So um, as you know, Dr. Dahimi, um, you met my son a couple of weeks ago or whenever, I don't, anyway, and he is currently on um, a prescribed a, a benzodiazepine with his methadone and two, they've been tapering. Two benzodiazepine. Yeah, two benzodiazepines, right, yeah. excuse me. And um, he's being tapered down now. He, uh, is there a program for a person that's on Medicaid, Medi-Cal, who, um, that you know of, that is currently taking the methadone and a benzodiazepine, the two benzodiazepines that are tapering and still can stay on their methadone and go through a detox program and still um, be able to take their methadone along with that. Is there a program out there? Not that I know of. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist. I'm just not aware. Your uh -huh. son's situation is really um, unusual in some ways in that somebody's prescribing him two benzodiazepines, including Xanax, which is the most dangerous one, while being on methadone. And, um, and he's not getting it from the methadone clinic, right? Nope. It's, an outside, it's an outside doctor that actually yeah. is associated in Oakland. Um, they get referred by the methadone clinic. Okay, that's so, my next question. He, that yeah. guy must be working in conjunction. You would think. 
the clinic. You would think. Unfortunately, I don't get involved in it. You know, my son takes care of his own thing. I mean, granted, I pray every day that he doesn't overdose on, on uh, the combination, but he, um, you know, he does communicate with his counselors and his doctors and they know he has it and they continue to taper him off of the methadone. Um, you know, obviously he was on 225 milligrams down to 95 now, um, but still he wants to get off those benzos and he's been doing this taper mm -hmm. um, and it's time. been a long process. He was on a lot more and now he's, he, he needs to get off of it and he wants to get off of it. And it's very hard for him to do it to be self-disciplined, as you know, what kind of hold that that medication has on them. Yeah. So I was just curious if you knew of anywhere that, that they would be able to- Off the top of my head, and, but you, it's not, you know, you can do some, some pretty quick research and find out. Um, unfortunately, the amount of programs that are Medicaid, Medi-Cal, that do, do any kind of detox or whatever are few and far between, um, mm -hmm. but they do exist. Um, so number one, well, what if a patient did have met, what if, I'm sorry. Oh, number what two, if a patient did have willing to take on your son's set of circumstances. Right. Your son really needs to, I mean, be looking at a very prolonged withdrawal. There's, I, I right. wouldn't, I wouldn't um, try to rapidly detox him at all because mm -mm. there's no way that works out well. Um, no. Nope. I even worry about him coming off the methadone, to be honest with you. Um, benzos, he needs to be off of those, but, um, you know, to, to be up at a dose of 225 milligrams of methadone to stabilize behavior and cravings, that's a, it's a pretty extremely high dose. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. but you know, maybe he's a lot better in other ways, uh, than he used to be. And, and, you know, it's reasonable to bring him down and maybe he gets to some level where he's like, nope, now I have too much cravings. I want to stay here. You know, I don't and that's know. what he's doing right now. Yes. Uh -huh. He figured that out on his own, that he started to have the cravings and his doctor and, you know, at the clinic, they, they've been keeping him at the 95, but still the benzos are still there and he wants yeah. to get off of those. Yeah. And this is the other thing, tapering two drugs like that at the same time is, is, is tricky. Um, you know, I would do the benzos first and then address right. the methadone later personally, um, if I had a choice. Um, just because you're kind of like, they work through different, uh, mechanisms in your brain and, um, one can destabilize the other if you, if you run into trouble. So. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, I appreciate, you know, your help. I mean, I, not, you know, he's working on it, but you know, obviously as a mother, I'm always anxious and wanting to set expectations and yeah. hoping that he, he'll be able to do that. I try to stay in my own lane and try not to get involved, but I yeah. still have my own questions. And, um, and if something should come up that he asks again, that he wants to go into a program, is there one available? Cause we've been down that road, you know, many times of trying to get off the benzos and he's achieved that, but then he went back to it as he started to taper, as you said, it's very hard for them to taper and not have some kind of a setback. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when he was coming off the methadone from the 225, that's when they put him back on there. So. Hi. Um, Go ahead. College Hospital accepts Medi-Cal and they do a, a medical detox. It's in Costa Mesa. Okay. Costa Mesa. All right. Is that a state hospital or is that a private or what? Um, it's, it's, it's a private. Okay. This brings up, um, if I can jump in here real quick and talk to Shelly. Um, you had mentioned that coming off buprenorphine scared you, just like coming off methadone is extremely hard. Um, some people just can't do it. And buprenorphine, it, it can, the sublingual daily can be, can be very challenging as well. We can do it, but you have to have a motivated patient. Um, but this is one of the, the other huge benefits of sublocade is that um, if somebody decides that they, they want off of sublocade, we essentially do nothing because it'll last in their body um, well beyond that month. Um, sometimes we see positive buprenorphines in urine six months after the last shot. So what that means is your body's metabolizing it and getting rid of it very, very, very slowly over a very long period of time. And that's the same as like a really slow taper. So 
it's an auto taper effectively. Um, so uh, that's another real big upside of sublocate is coming off of it is you don't do anything special. Yeah. Can, now, can a methadone patient, uh, I'm sorry, can a methadone patient uh, go from methadone to um, sublocate or what, what do they have to do? They have to get down to a low enough dose of methadone to make the transition over. 30 and milligrams, is that correct? How much? 30 milligrams is what I was told. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't try with any more than 30 milligrams. And then that patient would have to be willing to allow themselves to go into pretty nasty level of withdrawal before we'd start them on the sublingual, which is the oral buprenorphine, very small doses, and then titrate them up on the oral and down on the methadone. And then when they stabilize, we give them the shot. But that's, um, that, that, that's tricky, especially if the patient's not in a controlled environment. Um, getting a methadone patient down to 30 in and of itself is challenging. And then, and then having them go into withdrawal on purpose um, the problem with methadone, as you know, is extremely long half-life. That means that days after you stop taking it, it's, there's still a lot of it in your body. And if you give them the buprenorphine too soon, it'll force them into precipitated withdrawal, which is an uh, uh, unwanted withdrawal state, which is really nasty. So um, we've done it, um, but, but it, it can be kind of tough. I do have... Uh... Diana was trying to ask a question on her iPhone. She's now signed in on her computer. Go ahead, Diana. Hi, everybody. Yeah, I was asking about, um, hi, Jeanette. Hi. Um, my son will be getting out in approximately four, four and a half months. Hopefully, they will have completed the, um, he's trying to get on the ISUDT program. So, but with the coronavirus, it's kind of put a little bit of a stall on that. So, Hopefully that's going to be in place and they're going to have a discharge plan in place for him. If not, though, he definitely wants to be on some kind of a maintenance program. He's been to rehab 19 times. Nothing has worked for him. Jeanette knows. She, I see her shaking her head. Yep. Um, and Amy knows. So um, got to do something because he's going to be coming home and it's going to be the first time he's been allowed home in a number of years. So um, just trying to see what the options might be. But if the ISUDT doesn't happen and they don't have a plan in place, um, Medi-Cal does cover this now. Is that, I think I heard you say, because that's all he's going to have. He's not going to have any insurance yeah. when he gets out. So, Medi-Cal um, covers, covers the, the, the medication portion of it. Yep. Okay. All right. Perfect. Well, at least I have a backup plan. <laughs> yeah. And that's a very expensive shot. And they, they're, you missed us talking about it, but of all the insurers, they, 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 they're the fastest at approving it and getting it to us. I actually was listening on my iPhone. I just couldn't talk for some wow. reason. So I did hear all of that. I've been, I've been on since the beginning. So I did hear all of that. So that's good to hear because previously Medi-Cal didn't help with anything. And so, um, Jeanette's been, a, Jeanette's gotten him into a number of places and Amy's, um, uh, now, home. I just drew a total blank on it, what it's called. But Amy has saved his life multiple times. So, um, it's Narcan. Yeah, Narcan. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> drew a total blank. <laughs> so, anyhow, thank you. You're welcome. And then there was one more question. If you could just reiterate the difference between um, somebody had a question if buprenorphine was sublocate. And I, I'm, it, they were saying is buprenorphine and sublocate the same thing? If you could discuss. Yeah. So, buprenorphine and sublocate. And buprenorphine is the active drug in Suboxone, Subutex, and Sublocade. Um, Sublocade is simply the word for uh, the injectable form of buprenorphine. You can go to their website. Um, I think it's called uh, sublocade.com, and they have uh, FAQs there, or frequently asked questions. Um, and then they have a, a commercial, keep moving forward there, that, that sort of talks about it a bit. But so the oral formulations are all absorbed through your, um, your mucous membranes in your mouth. They're not swallowed. That's why it's called sublingual, or meaning below the tongue. And um, every single one of those formulations has buprenorphine. The only difference between them is how much buprenorphine and whether it's mixed with naloxone, which is a drug to prevent in IV injection of it. It's a deterrent. Um, whereas sublocate is just pure buprenorphine in a special matrix that when it comes in contact with some of your body tissues, 
it forms a it forms a pellet, and that pellet then just leaks buprenorphine for well past a month. Um, that answer the question. Uh, I believe that did. Um, Marian. Cool. Yeah, thank you very much. Appreciate it. You're welcome. So if anybody else has a question, um, we did put our phone number up in the group chat. You can write that down and give our office a call. But I just wanted to thank Shelly and, um, and everybody that joined today. I'm trying to unmute you guys. There you go, Jeanette. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so thank you, Shelly and, and Dr. Dahimi and everybody who's here today. And um, we've been doing these with you guys every week. So I believe Thursday next week is our, is our allotted time. Um, There's a, a video that everybody on this should go watch if you wanna understand more about um, the changes that happen in your brain. Um, Jeanette, is it called Neuroscience of Addiction 101? Or what is it yeah. called? Yeah, yeah. let me find it. Science uh, title. Yeah, it's like a 30 minute video and it's done by what's called Complex Care and you can find it on YouTube. And it's one of the best, single best uh, um, sort of uh, talks on dopamine and how when you use drugs, um, the dopamine system is affected. And I strongly encourage anybody that wants to get insight into what's happening on a sort of neurobiological level, watch that that 30 minute um, YouTube. Thank you. And thank you everybody for your questions. Um, I really enjoy uh, having the chance to, to answer these and, and hopefully um, educate people and, and sort of uh, dispel misunderstandings. Um, the, the end goal is just to get everybody to understand better what their choices are because we've come to realize that people often don't know that there are these certain options out there available to them. And just like in Shelly's case, that one time can make all the difference in the world. So um, that's, what our, that's what our goal is here. I'm very thankful. Thanks, you guys. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you for taking time as well, Shelly. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.